Fight Club taught us, the things we own end up owning us. Owning us. All around the world, 274 nomads all over Ukraine. Ukraina, Ukraina Bojan. Good morning from beautiful Primalstein, Croatia. So as some of you know, the reason why I actually came here is to give a talk at the Nomad Base Conference. There's about 274 digital nomads here uh, in that building. And this is people who work online from all over the world. Uh, many from Germany or you know, Austria, uh, the US, all around Europe. And today's talk is gonna be about how being a digital nomad, uh, especially kind of a minimalist has kept me not only physically but also financially okay during uh, these crazy times after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and also how I've been able to use the skills I've learned from digital marketing uh, to help fundraise for Ukraine and what's going on there. So let's go inside and get started. And here to greet me in the morning. <laughs> And I decided to talk about my most passionate, well, the, the topic I'm most passionate about, and it's myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Dean Kuchel, or where I've been on social media, because that's really what matters nowadays. And I've been a digital nomad for nine years, and I set myself the mission to visit all 196 countries of the world. And I was very fortunate to travel and explore more than 103 countries so far. To finance this journey, this expedition, I do multiple things. All right, Dean's talk was super amazing, really inspiring. I went back to the room to grab this flag. Yes. I decided we need to make it part of the talk, my talk at least. And today, for our next talk, we have a, a rock star. She's been seven years a TV presenter on German TV, and she's the co-founder of the largest life coaching uh, platform. When you meet her, you can't miss her kindness and her love and presence. Please welcome warmly with me, Nadine Kleikers. How many of you struggle in relationships? How many of you don't know what I mean if I say relationships? <laughs> we are all having relationships, right? We have relationships and a partnership. We have a relationship to our mother, to our father, to our friends. We have a relationship to ourselves. <laughs> and that's the feeling of healthy attachment. Wow. Thank you, Nadine. Please, Rory, virtually and D. All right, thank you so much. Uh, you know what, let's, let's have all the guys stand up this time. You know, I believe in equality. Okay. Good looking, handsome men, good to have you. Uh, and then all the women. <laughs> all the women, stand up please as well. Stand, guys stand, stay up. And you know what, I think that the air squat thing is a good idea. Let's, let's do five today, just to get a little energy in, because I know we've been sitting here all morning. This is gonna be, my talk today is just gonna be all fitness related. All right, very cool. Go ahead and sit down. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Johnny FD. I've been a nomad for over 10 years. I actually started, I left the US uh, in 2008. I had a corporate job, I had everything going for me. I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I graduated university with honors, uh, had a Lexus, had a Porsche, I had you know cool clothes, go to the bars, all that stuff. None of it really made me happy. Um, so 2008, quit my job, quit everything, moved to Thailand, and this talk is kind of the, the full circle, where as someone like in the beginning, we, we didn't have Nomad Base, we didn't have this community, we didn't have blogs, we didn't have podcasts, it was really hard to figure out. So now I feel very fortunate that we can share this, uh, this knowledge with each other, because I screwed up so many times in my life, and I think that's why I always want to share and, and let people learn from my lessons because I don't want anyone to go through the same thing. I wish this info was out there. 
when, when I got started. Uh, I'm curious, who here is kind of just starting out with your nomad journey? Can you raise your hands? All right, so quite a you know, bit of people. And is anyone here kind of like you feel like you kind of towards the end where you kind of want a home base, you kind of want to settle down a little bit more, you kind of want to slow down on traveling? Also a lot of people, all right? So hopefully the lessons uh, I've learned in the last you know, decade or so and also today's talk will help both of you. Uh, digital nomadism saved my life. It's a bit exaggerated, but it did help me tremendously, especially these last couple months uh, when my life was completely turned up and down. You know, I was so used to living carry on only out of a bag, kind of like Dean and a lot of nomad kind of minimalists. Who, who here actually travels carry on only? Can you raise your hands? These people have discovered the ultimate travel hack, the life hack. <laughs> For anyone who hasn't tried it yet, it's hard. I, I, I know it's hard to kind of give up things and be like, ah, but I need this, I need this. But I guarantee you, once you start doing it, you realize how free you are. And the other kind of trick to it is if you have enough money where you can just kind of buy, you know, and things aren't even expensive, like just buy the new big thing of toothpaste or buy the new uh, body wash or buy some new t-shirts wherever you go, it really makes your life so much easier. Because as, you know, Fight Club taught us, the things we own, end up owning us. And it's so true, it's so damn true. So having the experience uh, of traveling as a minimalist digital nomad, sleeping kind of anywhere, not knowing what was next, uh, but also the skills I learned building businesses, working online, marketing, networking, it saved, it saved me financially, physically, and mentally. But let's kind of rewind a bit. So in 2008, moved to Thailand, but I was doing scuba diving and Muay Thai for the first five years, uh, thinking this is kind of the, the path I want to go on. But around that time, I started realizing, you know what, I'm not enjoying uh, waking up on these beautiful beaches anymore. I'm not enjoying diving anymore. I'm not enjoying doing the sport I liked. I don't want to be that old British guy who just complains every day and just, oh, I don't want to be here. All right. <laughs> And that's when I was like, okay, I either need to move back to the US or I need to learn how to earn money online. And this is before, you know, freelancing was popular, remote work was popular, where there was any of this info. So I kind of accidentally stumbled on into becoming a nomad. Uh, my, my first business was on Amazon, I had some Kindle books. But then throughout the, the years, I had this weird kind of obsession with just trying different things. Like every time you hear about a new business, uh, you know, whether it's you know, on Amazon or dropshipping or affiliate marketing or Udemy or coaching or you know, uh, programming, <laughs> app making, whatever it is, I wanted to try all of them. So I would spend you know, six months learning something, building it, and then you know, having it get profitable and then automating it. And at some point, uh, I had like probably 10 plus businesses, uh, all kind of on this, you know, cool passive, you know, income dream that we, that we all inspire for. What I have learned though, since then is there's no real such thing as passive income. If you're not logging into your accounts and growing the business, it is slowly dying. But what I also learned from it is pretty much everything works. Like all the businesses that you'll hear about this week from all the different top, you know, speakers, all these things you, you heard on the different podcasts, like they almost all work, but they all have downsides. N none of them are easy. None of them are overnight. Uh, and they all are a real business and you have to treat it that way. But at my kind of high point, I was making $30,000 a month and it was, it blew my mind. Cause I never thought that would, that would ever be possible. My parents combined never made $30,000 in a year. And by the kind of end of my decade journey, I decided that that's it. I'm done. I sold my businesses. Uh, and one kind of business hack is whenever you're building something, ask yourself, is this something that I can sell later on? Uh, whether, you know, it's, you know, you know, physical products or online products, whatever it is. If the day you quit, you lose everything, then you really just relied on the money you made during that time. But if it's something that is an asset that you can sell to someone else, 
you can get two or three years of future profits uh, now from that on. And that's kind of a huge hack. The second big hack is saving and investing most of what you make. As nomads, we're really lucky that cost of living were actually pretty low. I mean, sure, if you're flying you know, all the time, you know, flying a business class and staying in expensive places, it's more expensive than living at home. But you know, if you spend two or three months in each location, you get like a local apartment, you know, you're you know, being a minimalist, life's pretty cheap. You know? I flew here you know, for $13 from Krakow, uh, even though my Airbnb was kind of expensive due to the situation. You know, all in, if you're spending $600 to $1,000 a month, including your bills, it's probably actually cheaper than even just living home. So if you're able to grow your income while keeping your costs low, it's actually relatively easy to save, you know, 50% or even, uh, in my case, 80% of, of everything you earn, especially all the tax hacks and everything that we get from being location independent. So that is what really set me up. But I was tired. 10 years, I went to all the countries I wanted to go to. I stopped enjoying sunsets, believe it or not. <laughs> I remember like the, the, the moment I realized this is done is I was on, I think, Koh Penang, and it was my friend from the US had come visit me, and he was like, oh my God, Johnny, stop, stop. And I'm like, what? And he's like, look at this. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, you, Johnny, look at it. It's, like, look how amazing the sunset is. And I was like, yeah, I've seen it like a thousand times. <laughs> and that's when I realized I gotta do something else. I had reached all my financial goals, uh, I had went everywhere I wanted to go, and on February 24th, 2021, I woke up and I realized I was a US dollar millionaire. I counted up the money I had in my investment accounts, my savings accounts, and in cash, and I was like, what the? Like, I, I, I knew I was, that was my goal, but I never thought it'd be possible. Now, I'm curious, like, with the raise of hands, who here is like, Wow, a million dollars is a lot of money. That's kind of a big goal, a big dream that can, that can buy a lot of things, right? And who here thinks, yeah, you know what? A million dollars isn't what it used to be. You can't actually buy what it, what it did. It can't really set you for life. You still have to work. And the thing is, both of you are correct. <laughs> On one hand, we need to be, you know, very appreciative that all of us in this room you know, have a very legitimate chance of, you know, 100% being millionaires uh, in our lifetimes. The fact that we all, you know, speak an international language, like English, the fact that we all, you know, are internet capable, uh, that we have this connection, you know, this knowledge, there's no reason why all of us can't be a millionaire one day. And it can buy a lot, it can change a lot, it can really, you know, you can do a lot of good things with it. But at the same time, you're right. Like, it really doesn't buy that much. I thought about it, and I was like, okay, yeah, should I just move back to San Francisco where I'm from and buy a house and buy a car and have a normal life? No, I, I couldn't even afford to buy a house without taking a 30-year mortgage. <laughs> you know, or if I did buy one, that's it. Like, how am I gonna pay property tax or bills? You know, I could buy this cool car, but then what? The maintenance costs, the, you know, the, the, the depreciation after five years, like, what is this, you know, half a million dollar car, car worth, nothing, all right? Uh, so on one hand, I had realized I had come a long way since when I started this nomad journey, you know, in 2013, when I really started my first business, I was down to $300 in my total net worth. And it sucks, I didn't wanna go back and work the nine to five again. But at the same time, when I became a millionaire, I was like, now what? And COVID lockdowns actually really changed me. You know, I, I'm sure it changed everyone in the world. Some for the better, some for the worse. A lot of people suffered through it. But it gave me time to think about what was really important, what I wanted. And I had decided, I wanna settle down. I want a home base. I wanted uh, something besides the US passport to allow me to continue living abroad or traveling. I never really talked about this, but even though I'm you know, born and raised in San Francisco, I'm American, I have a US passport. I never really felt that comfortable there. Like I, I never 
really felt like I belonged, you know. Uh, I traveled a little bit in the U.S., but it was never a place that I can see myself really 100%, you know, fitting in, like, fuck yeah, America, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, the mentality is different, you know, it's just like, and then there's no perfect country, but for me, it was just not a place that I saw myself living for the rest of my life and growing old. Uh, ironically, Ukraine was. And it's hard to explain for anyone who's never been there. And also, I'm sure it's not for everyone. But for me, it was kind of this perfect mix of the West and the East. You know? Uh, I mean, literally, there are, they are you know, basically in the center of, you know, on one side you have Asia, when you say you have Western Europe. Um, and little things like, Everybody takes off their shoes when they go into someone's house. In the U.S., that would drive me crazy when people wouldn't do that. You know, people have really, like, solid relationships to their grandparents, their babushkas, you know? And that's something I really enjoyed, when, you know, when I grew up. My parents, my grandparents all died when I was very young, and I never really had that. So I just had this connection. It was, it was you know, somebody had said over breakfast that, you know, sometimes you go somewhere and you just have this connection, and you can't really explain why. What helped was there was an easy path to permanent residency, basically a green card. I know they have it in more, you know, kind of desirable countries like Portugal has a great one. It starts around 280,000 euros, goes up to half a million, and you get an EU, uh, you know, permanent residency, which is great. Turkey uh, also had one for about 250,000, and last year before their economy collapsed, it, was, it seemed like a good place to to buy. Uh, but in Ukraine, it was only $100,000. I was like, oh, uh, that's not too bad. You know, you can invest it and you can use it to buy real estate or whatever it is. Let's do that. So I went through the process uh, to get the investor visa, all that stuff. And I bought uh, an apartment here in the center of Kiev. This is the building I live in. Uh, the, I probably spent about a third of my money you know, I, at first I thought I was like, oh, I'm just gonna spend 100 grand exactly. It turns out there was nothing that I wanted for exactly that much. Uh, and then when you, you know, factor in the cost of like lawyers and closing costs and all this other stuff, and then renovating the place, uh, and then me finding a second place I really liked and about it as well, uh, it ended up being about a third of everything I had. But I was, I was invested. I was like, this is it, this is gonna be my home. Luckily, I was smart enough to also put a third into a retirement account that I can't touch. I can't touch it until I'm 59 and a half, at least without huge penalties, which my accountant, Grace, probably would never let me do. <laughs> uh, so that money is kind of tucked away, but I know that's kind of the security of growing old and not having to worry about, am I ever gonna you know, be able to survive? Because as an American, we need to pay into the social security fund for 10 years, and I, never, I didn't work uh, in the US for 10 years. Also, I don't know if it's still gonna be around 10 years from now. Like, I don't really trust our government to take care of us when we're older. And this is kind of a life lesson number two, is we need to be self-reliant in, in our old age. You know, the, the days of having a government pension or a uh, you know, work pension, I don't think it's gonna be around by the time all of us are gonna retire. And if it wasn't for me putting a third of it in there, I wouldn't feel the stability that I do now. Uh, and my parents, they, they didn't do it, you know? I mean, I don't think they could have. They barely were able to afford, you know, living in the U.S. in the first place. So they definitely weren't thinking about putting, you know, 50 or 80% of their income into investments. They were basically just trying to put food on the table. And I decided, you know what, let me take care of them. You know, they were getting old. I think, you know, they were... 65 at the time, but my mom was still waitressing, you know, and standing, she was getting like foot problems. My dad was still driving a taxi on the weekends, and I was like, yeah, you know, just stop. Like, stop doing it. Let me just take care of you guys. So, you know, I basically paid all their expenses the last couple years, and I put, you know, I gave them another big chunk to put away, say like, this is yours, stop working. I also committed to paying their property tax for the next 10 years. Because in the US, and probably in a lot of countries, even though we own our homes, if we don't pay that huge tax every year or every month, they just take it back from you. So you don't really own it. So that's kind of where the money went. And you know, I, I probably lost a lot more 
with the you know, Ukrainian agreement crashing and all these other things happening. But basically, I had to start over. You know, uh, This was the apartment that I, I had bought and I spent the last year of my life pouring my heart and soul into to renovating. It's over 100 years old and it kind of looked like this when I got it. And I spent every day you know, with the, the contractors, the designers, you know, restoring these beautiful 100-year-old ceilings, exposing the old brick wall and taking off the wallpaper, redoing the floors, sanding all the original doors. It would have been so much easier and cheaper just to get rid of all of that and just put in laminates and you know, new wallpaper or something, but it was like a, a pride. And I wanna warn everyone, if you value minimalism and being able to travel and freedom and having you know, no responsibilities and you know, extra money you know, in your bank account, don't buy a, a house. <laughs> <laughs> it is the worst investment you can make financially <laughs> because even the people who end up making a lot from their house, they don't really you know, put in the hours that they, the sweat equity they put in, uh, the fact that they probably would have made the same if they just put that money into almost anything else. But what it does do is it ties you to place, it puts your soul into a place. And exactly on the same freaking day after I became a millionaire, one year later, Russia takes it all from me. And not just from me, from 44 million Ukrainians around the world. I, I, I didn't think it would happen. I, if you asked me one month earlier, I said, no, Putin's not crazy enough to attack a, a free country. There, there's no way they're going to come bomb, you know, Kiev. It's 2022. This isn't, you know, the 1800s. It's not like these history books we, we read. I was like, there's zero chance. I even went on RT America a month before saying, yeah, we're not worried here in Kiev. Everything is normal. Like, like none of us think, you know, Russia's going to attack. There's no way Russia's going to attack. And it was the worst you know, judgment called my life. And I fucked up, all right? I went from being a millionaire, live, sleeping in the house that I helped build with, you know, 10 years of my, my, you know, me slaving away, saving every penny, investing it, to sleeping in a refugee center with 500 other people with the lights completely bright all night on these, these you know, donated cots. I went from having a house full of you know, furniture that I had picked out, you know, uh, I, that I had you know, chose every little detail, I, to living here and being a nomad and minimalist once again. All I was able to take with me was that same duffel bag that I had traveled with the last five years, you know, probably 60 liters worth of, of things. And, even then, with no stability, not knowing what's going to happen financially, physically, mentally, I knew I was still okay. Because being a nomad for so many years had prepared me for this. I was used to changing countries all the time. I was used to sleeping in random, uncomfortable places. I was used to traveling on a budget. I was used to you know, working remotely and earning online. But unfortunately, you know, we are a minority. Even though there's 274 people here in this room, even though our communities you know, are around the world, we're really still a very tiny portion of the population. And the vast majority of Ukrainians were uprooted from their homes without any notice. So I decided I'm gonna dedicate, you know, as long as it takes to help uh, in whatever I can. And luckily with all the skills I had learned with digital marketing, and you know Photoshop and you know content creation and you know you know SEO and all this stuff. I was like, you know what? Let me put this to good. So I went back to Ukraine <laughs> and I started filming uh, and doing interviews with people who are in these areas that were completely devastated. And for anyone who's a little bit confused about like how you know what the situation is like now, the center of Kiev, the capital, thank God, is completely relatively untouched, but it's because the Ukrainian soldiers are smart enough to basically, basically turn into an island. They destroyed their own bridges, they flooded all the fields around, and that way the Russian forces couldn't get close enough 
to, to shell with artillery. A few missiles still came to attack and, you know, unfortunately, lives were lost. But really, it's the outskirts. And to really put it in perspective, think about your hometown where you grew up. You know, the, the, the biggest city, your capital, whatever it is. And think of it as your, that place, you know, Berlin is, is okay, or, you know, um, Washington is okay, whatever it is. But all the, the small towns and villages and suburbs around it are completely destroyed. And there is a lot of, you know, talk on whose fault it was. Was it NATO expansion? Was the U.S. meddling? Was, you know, was it the three, uh, you know, Nazis that just slipped through? It's, and all those discussions in peacetime, yeah, let's talk about that. I think it's important to talk about these things. But the clear fact is Russia invaded a peaceful country and they started killing everybody. They started killing civilians. They started killing kids, doing things that are unimaginable. And if Russia had never attacked, none of this would have happened. So I've been fundraising for them through my YouTube channel. I've been able to raise already $25,000 through a charity called Razam for Ukraine. Thank you. And you know, they were you know, the, the best charity I can find that was actually in the ground. Because even though it's nice to donate to you know, these bigger charities, unfortunately, a lot of that money gets kind of mismanaged or it just takes a long time. So you know, if you do you know, end up donating, donate to the, the orphanage that uh, Odis will talk about on Friday, uh, or someone in a charity who's actually on the ground there and not UNICEF or Red Cross or something like that. Uh, but I also decided, you know what? I know a lot of people in Ukraine still who need money now. They can't wait for any of these organizations to send goods over. I want to just send them money. Like, I wanted to message every single person I knew that I ever met there, from the coffee shop person to my house cleaner to the person doing my floors, and just say, do you need anything? And if I had any hesitation that they were, you know, that everything wasn't okay, I would just send them $500 or $1,000. And I did this through GoFundMe. And it still boggles my mind that this you know, community that has somehow built through you know, the digital nomad community, uh, as well as on YouTube, I've now raised $39,000 through here as well. And the thing is, like, what was really nice about this is this was able to very quickly, like literally within you know, seconds or days, go direct to people who need it. And also I can pick and choose things that weren't getting attention that I knew were very valuable. So aside from you know, sending you know, food and supplies, humanitarian goods, we also funded you know, these volunteers uh, who needed these EOD kits to uh, safely dismantle mines. And I didn't even think of this until I was filming one day and one of the soldiers was like, no, 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 don't step on that. And I was like, there's still active mines here? It's a playground. And he's like, yeah, like we, we don't have the time or energy to do it. And that very day, I went home and I sent $2,000 to a volunteer group. Uh, I think they're actually from Sweden that came, that had these skills to, do, to fix mines. So the world is coming together and it's been so amazing. Uh, we also help fund a four by four ambulance that's able to go to the front lines of Donetsk and help bring people out. It's, it's been like a new, a new mission, a new goal that I never thought, you know, this remote work stuff would help uh, somehow, you know, <laughs> push forward. So this photo uh, is taken somewhere, you know, 40 minutes outside of Kiev in one of these, these villages that you know, we're standing on this burnt out uh, Russian tank or APC. And this meant so much to me, you know, not only, you know, holding up the Ukrainian flag and showing our support, you know, knowing that, you know, we have two Americans, we have a girl from Holland, you know, but we also have the soldiers who stayed to help. And these guys, uh, they were going into the war zone, not only to defend the country and stop these tanks, which his battalion did, but also bringing food to people who couldn't you know, get anything during those two months. And this, these berries that he's holding, uh, Kalina, it's, very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good symbol because these are berries that can survive the winter in Ukraine, which is not easy. I barely survived it. 
<laughs> they were covered in snow, uh, but in the spring, they reemerge and they're strong, they're good for you, they have full of antioxidants, and they make a great tea. <laughs> and this really represents the, the strength and power of Ukraine. And this is why I know Ukraine will win and we'll get through this. So I'm sure, you know, most of us uh, in this room, I've never learned uh, how to say anything in Ukrainian. Uh, but today I want to share this phrase, Ukraina Primoja. Ukraina Primoja. Ukraina Primoja. Thank you. Okay. And this phrase, I think it's, it's, it's important to learn uh, because unfortunately a lot of people in Ukraine think they're alone. They think no one cares about them. They think that, you know, they're just this kind of relatively small country in the hands of this you know, big bad tyrant who's just doing whatever they want. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in Ukraine, you know, still you know, don't speak English and they don't realize how supportive the world is. And they don't realize that the whole world wants them to have their freedom. They want them to have their lives. They want them to be able to return home safely. So that's why I wanted to share this, this word and a message to stand with Ukraine. I'll be okay. I survived learning all these things, you know, throughout the years of being a nomad, even though I wanted to just, you know, not quit, but at least take a break and enjoy a new chapter in my life. This war has forced me to go back to being a minimalist digital nomad. And I'll get through it. So don't worry about me. Let's worry about the people who haven't had, you know, the, the luck of growing up in the countries that, that we grew up, you know, learning these international languages, you know, maybe as a kid, uh, being able to work remotely and earn, you know, US dollars or euros. Uh, let's, let's stand with Ukraine. Thank you guys. And one uh, easy way we can do this is just taking a photo and just showing that we, from all around the world, 274 nomads are with Ukraine. Ukraina, Predemoje! Ukraina, Predemoje! Ukraina, Predemoje! Ukraina, Predemoje! <laughs> all around the world. Thank you. 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 Thank you.